eighteen, etc. There were some things, at least, that Theseus did not lie about. In the years that were to come, I would count these up, these scraps of honesty here and there tangled up in the sea of deceit in which he swam so effortlessly. Firstly, it was true that Athens did welcome me, far more than I expected. Gradually, I stopped listening for whispers in dark corners. At Knossos, our family disgrace trailed behind us like a chain we were forced to drag, pulling us down, tripping us up. In Athens, I was amazed to find I could move freely without its weight. Instead of condemnation, I found sympathy. The citadel was small, smaller than I had expected having been accustomed to the sprawling splendor of Knossos. I asked Theseus to show me, show me it all, hoping that as we walked I would be able to draw more from him, to piece together my sister's final moments on Naxos. He never spoke of it, though, despite my best efforts. I did not have the skill of manipulation of coaxing and cajoling. I was used to a more direct approach. If I asked him about that night, he would frown and curtly find a reason to bring our conversation to a close. He was, of course, happy to talk about his exploits. I heard many times how he had vanquished our minotaur, crushing it into a whimpering mass of blood, hair and horns in the blackness of the labyrinth. He embroidered his heroics, rehearsing them for me time and time again. I stopped listening and instead took the, in the details of my new home. The citadel was snugly protected in its fortifications on the flat summit of the mountain we had climbed on the, my first day. The stone steps cut into its side led down to the harbour and the snaking river that flowed from the fertile valleys which sprawled lush and verdant below, so unlike the dry, dusty rocks of Crete. Together, we would stroll through the bustle of the mar marketplace where traders competed energetically to sell glistening heaps of olives, rich golden honey, amphorae, of dark red wine, piles of jewellery and ceramics. I knew why Theseus liked to walk amongst his people. They revered him almost like a god, the man who had saved them from the inhuman brutality of the Cretans. But they would press their gods upon me as well, smile at me and call out my name too. I can't deny I felt a little frisson walking at the sight of a man so adored by his public. His glory reflected on me, his chosen concert. Through the busy centre, he would make our way to the western edge of the city where a reverend hush prevailed. The mighty gnarled olive tree, its branches so laden with fruit, twisted its way from the earth where Athena had struck the ground to make it grow when she had competed with Poseidon for the city where we now stood. Beside it was a shrine, a constant stream of priestesses went about their worship, presiding over the rites of the goddess. I enjoyed the exploration of Athens more than I expected, even though it did not yield up the truth I longed for from my companion. The closest that Theseus came to discussing it with me was when he warned me to keep my silence. Do not tell people here of your part in the matter, he told me early on. I looked at him, his face so handsome but so uninteresting to me now, was set sternly, and he did not catch my eye, staring resolutely ahead instead. What matter? I asked. I wanted to make him say it. The killing of the mind tore. The saving of the, of the hostages that both Ariadne and I had played a vital role in. Who had restored his precious club to him, and now he wanted me to pretend it was all his doing. Another story to build his legend. His features darkened. The Cretan meta, his tones were clipped. The people here are sympathetic to you. They know 
that you were a prisoner of your father, just as much as our own Athenian children were. Of course, you would hate and fear the monster, of course. You are glad to be free of it now. But if they knew that you and your sister were prepared to betray your own city, your own family, the threat remained unspoken, but I heard it clearly enough. And although it galled me to admit it, he was right. He advised me that it was better to feign ignorance, to say that he conquered our labyrinth alone and rescued Ariadne from the tyrannical rule of Minos, out of pity for her soft heart, which had bled for the quivering hostages, so that none would suspect what a rebellious heart I might nurture within my breast. It was Theseus's city, I did as he said, and for a time, although I had feared I would break apart entirely, everything held together surprisingly well. There were great celebrations across the city for the Minotaur's death, and every harvest thereafter, when no tributes were sent across the waves to a terrible fate, Theseus reveled in the glory it brought him each year. In between times, however, I observed a listlessness to his demeanor, and I thought I knew how I could work it to my advantage. The people are still so grateful to you, I commented to him one day, out in the palace courtyard. He was sprawled on a couch, his whole posture radiating a certain sullenness. A languor which I could tell chafed against his nature. Your feats in the labyrinth, have truly earned you a fame beyond imagining. I watched him closely. Flattery was the key to Theseus's will. I had needed to learn the subtlety I had so far lacked, and I had been refining it for this very moment. I forced myself to assume a casual tone, to stare up into the sky as though I spoke inconsequential thoughts. I wonder how long their gratitude will last, I commented. How long they will remember. That irritated him. He was so easy to inflame. He sat up, bristling. I have saved the lives of their children. Over and over again, he snapped. They should remember it every day, when they look into their smiling faces and be thankful that their bones are not scattered in a Cretan dungeon. Oh, of course they should, I hasten to agree, that you know what people are like. His brows drew together, confused. What do you mean? Well, they forget that what could have been and focused only on the irritations of today. Never mind that he saved our children from being devoured alive. Why does he not stop the city thieves or repair the walls? I saw the clouds darkening his face and quickly added. Just an example. I swallowed, laid a soothing hand on his arm and looked, in, looked at him in the eye. But people are fools, I said gently. Why would the mighty Theseus stoop to the conquering of common thieves? Such a thing is beneath you, the greatest hero since Heracles. I waited whilst that sank in. I knew that it was not enough for him to follow in the footsteps of his great mentor. He longed to surpass the feats of Heracles, but Heracles had slain many more monsters than just one minotaur. Who cares what they might think, I said about after a pause. Their opinions do not matter. Now I must away to, pre to prepare for the feasting later. Theseus loved the feast. And it would always take time for my handmaidens to arrange my hair, my dress, my jewels, all to his satisfaction. It was the opportunate, opportune moment to leave him, with my parting words fermenting in his breast. Theseus cared only for the opinions of others, and I knew it. It worked far more quickly than I had imagined. Within only a matter of days, Theseus strode across the throne room with great excitement to tell me that he was set to he was to set sail shortly another quest had presented itself to him and he would answer its call the day-to-day -day business of ruling the city did not excite him i knew though he would not admit it he was more than happy to relinquish the min minuti 
of it all to his advisers. There were tyrants to vanquish across the world and monsters to defeat, and only he could do it. Of course, this was only the first quest of many, and I soon found that Theseus was gone for great swaths of time. Whenever I waved him off from the harbour, I felt a great sense of relief flood my body, buckling me. Anyone watching might have thought I sank to the ground with the anguish of missing him or the worry that he would be killed. It was not so. My relief was washed with guilt always. Had the gods seen into my shallow little heart that night with Theseus and Ariadne? If you had cracked me open on those rocks and laid my soul bare, I could not deny the cringing little corner of it that longed for my sister to vanish, that I might be alone with Theseus. Not like this, true, I never wished her harm, but my existence in Athens, freed from the nightmare of the labyrinth, promised to the hero who had saved us all, was what I had dreamed of when I stared out over the sea at Knossos. Was this my punishment, to live the reality of my dream, and find out that its glittering beauty faded to nothing when I stepped close? As time took me further away from that night, I began to wonder, in the thrill of the moment, was it possible that I really had misheard Theseus? If I had listened more carefully, could I have been there at the right cove when they left? If so, I could have prevailed upon Ariadne to stay within the safety of the ship. She would have slept warm and living beside me, and we would be in Athens together now. Try as I might, I could not picture it. Perhaps Artemis would have struck us both down. I grieved for my sister still, but life in the Athenian court was full of diversions, and in Theseus's lengthy absences, I flourished as I had never done in Crete. I felt pangs of longing sometimes for my mother whenever my any visitor came to our shores who might have news of my lost home. I pounced upon them, and so I learned that Minos remained lost, the Eucalian's rule remained moderate, and Pasiphae was always in her herb garden, seemingly at peace. As I grew older, I studied the elders and paid careful attention to how a city was run when it was not governed by fear and teeth and blood. When Theseus came back, I gave a fair impression of someone held captivated by his grandiose tales. Oh, they were rollicking, yarns crammed full of adventure and excitement, but I grew so weary of hearing how faultless he was, always one step ahead of the enemy, stronger then all and triumphant to the last. Still, I knew that it would never be long before the siren call of glory enticed him back to the seas again, and Athens would be mine once more. Mine to do what with, I wasn't sure. A princess was a princess wherever she was, and in Athens, like Crete, the pastimes available seemed limited to weaving, dancing, and smiling at men. It was Ariadne, it was Ariadne who had danced, not me. I had watched her flinging herself into the steps, losing herself in their magic, and declared myself uninterested in learning. I knew that I would never move like my sister, that I would never possess her grace. Weaving, meanwhile, was something we had done together. It pierced my heart to stand before the loom in the empty chamber in Athens, and pass the dreary hours spinning a story in cloth without her there. So that just left smiling. It wasn't long before my steps turned irresistibly towards the lure of the busy hall in which the business of the palace was conducted. Eyebrows were raised the first time I walked in, and I felt the gaze of the elite man and of Athens rest questioningly on me. I summoned that royal smile, the brightest I could, and stepped forward. I hope to sit with you this morning, I said. I directed my voice, words to Pandion, a kindly middle-aged man in whom I knew Theseus placed his trust. That is not really the custom of Athens, he said mildly. The thought flashed across the others' faces, 
as unmistakable as lightning. This is Athens, a civilized place. Whatever goings-on occurred in Crete, it is different here. I straightened my shoulders. If Theseus were here, he would take his place among you, I said sweetly. But he fights great battles over the seas to bring peace and justice to the world in the name of Athens. And whilst he fights them, he leaves me here with no guide to this new city. I know that he wants me to learn how a fair and righteous kingdom is run. Besides, I hesitated, th taking great, taking heart from the fact that they listened to me, that I hadn't been laughed out of the hole or worse already. Besides, I have only known my father's way of government. I want to know a better way. I held my breath. They might take it as monstrous impudence, but I bargained on them feeling flattered and forgiving me for my greatly uncivilized ways, considering where I had come from. A smile spread almost reluctantly across Pend Pandian's face, and at his lad a low murmur of assent spread around the room. Princess, I hope you will not find our duties tedious. He said, I nearly laughed aloud. I loved that I could manipulate these dignified and important men, and in the folds of my dress, my fist curled in triumphant, in triumph as Pandian gestured to make me, to take me the smaller throne. The one that sat empty next to Theseus is towering one. We were speaking of reports we have had from Lorien, the hills to the south, Pandion resumed. Silver has been discovered there, and perhaps there is more to be mined. I learned forward, eager to hear it all. Now I had no power, it was true, but I listened. Where Theseus would slouch and stare and make excuses to leave, I sat bolt upright and paid attention. I did not speak a word out loud. I did not want them to think me too bold. But slowly I grew more and more adept at whispering in the right ears at the right time, and I found that I could make them believe I spoke for my intended husband whilst he was away. It grated on my nerves that they cared for my words only because they thought they came from my husband. Sometimes I could see how their eyes skated across my body, how insignificant they thought my mind was, but even if they imagined that I was merely a decorative conduit for Theseus's words, for the first time in my life the man who wielded the power stopped courteously to let me talk. I swallowed my frustration and used it to the best of my advantage. My eighteenth year loomed ahead of me. I wondered how long it, I might get away with this life. Theseus did not need a wife. He needed a graceful audience and someone to run the city whilst he carved his name into history. That our union was part of the truce with Crete and I knew it was inevitable. Eventually the day came when he sent word from his traveler, travels of his expected day of return and instructed that the preparations of, for our wedding should commence. Our wedding day, like the birth of the Minotaur, was a memory I did not allow. Whenever it flickered in my mind, the prevailing sense was that aching loss I felt without Ariadne by my side. Athenian hands, kindly enough but strange and distant, twisted my hair into braids and draped me in flowing fabrics. Not my sister, my sister who had dreamed of this day for herself. If I had hoped that marrying Theseus might quell some of the suspicion that still burned away within me, I was wrong. After we were married, I wondered yet more at his claim to have left Ariadne alone out of respect for her virtue. As far as I could see, Artemis, the goddess grimly wedded to her own chastity, would have little reason to send her serpent against Ariadne for helping Theseus out of the labyrinth. I could only surmise that my sister had paid the price for something else, something far more offensive to the virgin immortal, but Theseus, sleeping soundly beside me, would never tell.